which countries actually live the longest? Spoiler alert, it's not the United States. I know, it's what you were thinking, like we're the healthiest country in the world, but you know. Point is, is that we look at the literature and it looks like the blue zones are gonna be the healthiest countries. But when you actually look deeply at the literature and you look at the world data, you see that yeah, blue zones are, are healthy and they have a fair amount of centenarians, but there's a lot of things that we could poke holes in and we're gonna poke some holes in that. And we're gonna look at maybe some regions that we wouldn't have thought would have the longest life expectancy, but they actually do. Let's break it down. Now the blue zones are no doubt, like they're flawed, okay? I'm not saying that they're not amazing regions with healthy, vibrant people that live a long time. But to say that they're the healthiest regions in the world, it's flawed. Like it's somewhat true data, but it's also very flawed. And I think there's forgotten regions of the world that particularly live longer. And we might want to take more current advice from those regions because the blue zone data might be kind of old and the record keeping might be a little off kilter. But the first thing we have to look at that's really important, whether you're looking at blue zones or not, is there's a huge difference between the absolute number of centenarians, those are people over 100, and the relative number. For example, if you look at the United States, it's the second highest amount of centenarians, second highest amount of people over the age of 100 in the world, but it's only 24 people per 100,000. Compare that to, let's just say like South Korea is a good example. Absolutely a low number of centenarians, but per capita, we're talking over 40 centenarians per 100,000. So almost double that of America. You look at India, an absolute number of 27,000 and a relative amount of two per 100,000, right? So it's like a big country, still lo looks like a large number, but then, oh my gosh, that is not good at all. And you look at China, it's about four per 100,000. So my point in saying this is that big difference there, like population makes a difference. We wanna look at like true life expectancy and average lifespan and also health span, like the quality of life. So we'll investigate this a little bit more. Now, the biggest one we wanna look at first is Okinawa. Okinawa, the whole like Okinawans living the longest in the world, unfortunately, that is old data. It just is. There was a study that was published in Gerontology that really demonstrated that like Okinawans have no real advantage over mainland Japan. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna read an excerpt from the study for you. It should be noted that this longevity advantage in Okinawa is only observed for generations before World War II. Younger generation Okinawans are losing their longevity advantage. As a matter of fact, in 2005, the life expectancy of mainland Japan was more than that of Okinawa, which was still a good life expectancy. And here's the thing, everyone sees this and they wanna discredit what we've learned about the Okinawans. No, what we've learned about the Okinawans is still great. Sweet potatoes, slight caloric restriction, activity, all these things matter. The only thing that's off is that the reporting is not current. Everything that they were talking about before that we still tout about the Okinawan lifestyle is great. Like we're not touting the current Okinawan lifestyle, but we should know that we should not be looking to the Okinawans any more than we should be looking to mainland Japan. After World War II, Okinawans ate more, their calories went up, and the BMI has gone up quite a bit since then. So there's no real denying that. The chronic deficit that made the Okinawans famous isn't there anymore. The chronic deficit, beginning a slight caloric deficit, is seemingly good for longevity, but that deficit just isn't there anymore. So we can't tout the Okinawans as like the leader of that anymore. There's also been some serious reporting issues. So before we get into the countries that actually do live the longest, we need to understand there was some study published in Live Science that took a look at this and they found that what's kind of weird is that the countries that seem to have the highest amount of centenarians have these like things about them that are not conducive with living long. They had like uh, low literacy, low healthcare, high crime. So their actual average life expectancy was lower. And I'm not saying that there's anything like suspicious going on there. I'm thinking that there's some issues with data that are a little bit confused here. And then if you look at more literature, you find that like, once you actually account for birth certificates, things get really dodgy. As a matter of fact, there was a 2010 BBC report that found that there's 238,000 missing or dead centenarians in Japan. I don't think that it's like malfeasance. I think that what it is is like 
people died and there is poor record keeping, it's really hard to say like, oh, these people, yeah, they're over 100. Well, they're over 100, but they're dead. So it's not really helping us. And then if you look at the study that takes a look at birth certificates, when birth certificates are factored in and actually allowed to be incorporated, you lose 69 to 82% of your centenarians. I'm not saying they don't exist, but it's really hard to get accurate data when you don't have real records. Like, so you can say like, Mary Jane is 119 years old. She might be, but how can we prove it? She doesn't have a birth certificate. We don't know we're going by like old records. The thing is, it's just really hard to get that data. So what we need to look at now is the data that we do have. And we should be looking more at average life expectancy versus some like blue zone data. And again, I say with like all truth, the blue zones are amazing. Okay, like they are beautiful countries and those people do live long and I think we can learn a ton from them. But what are the newer countries that have the longest life expectancy? Well, according to world data, the first one that we look at isn't really a country, it's Hong Kong. Hong Kong has the highest average lifespan. Men live 83.2 years on average and women 87.9 years on average. And we're gonna break down each one of these individually with more stuff. I'm not just gonna give them to you and then walk away. Okay, the next up is going to be Switzerland. Switzerland is actually number three. So Switzerland, you're thinking, what happened to number two? Well, number two is one of the actual blue zones. Number three is Switzerland. Switzerland, it's very similar. We're looking about an 82 lifespan for men and another 87.9 for women. And we'll talk again about why that works. Here's what's really interesting though. Three of the top seven healthiest, longest living regions in the world are Nordic countries. We're talking like Sweden, Finland, Denmark, we're talking that region. So there's something we definitely need to learn about them. So let's first investigate Hong Kong, okay? Hong Kong, they eat a ton of stir fry. And the stir fry is not like the stir fry that you're gonna go get at Panda Express later today. The stir fry is like weird cuts of meat that maybe you haven't even seen before. But lots of lean fish, lean meat, all kinds of different shellfish, all kinds of different creatures, whatever, right? Point is, lots of protein. They don't skimp on the protein over there. Okay, there's also a lot of fiber. We've got bamboo shoots, we've got all that kind of stuff. We've got all kinds of veggies. And you think, that's a lot of rice. They probably are consuming a lot of rice, but they're consuming a ton of veggies and a ton of fiber and a ton of protein along with it. It's something to legitimately consider. The fiber content in like Hong Kong, but also we should mention even like Okinawa and Japan in general, extremely high fiber content. And what made Okinawans so like so kind of famed in the first place was their fiber intake. Those sweet potatoes, the purple sweet potatoes, extremely high soluble fiber intake. The microbiome is very, very, very important. And the diversity of our food is extremely, extremely important. And I can't think of something that's more diverse than like a stir fry. You've got your meat, you've got your veggies, you've got your stuff. Like if you're doing it right, it's really dang good. I usually tell people like the first thing you should focus on is getting your protein intake up if you're making a dietary change and then focusing on your gut. It all starts in the gut. I don't know how much more I can overemphasize that. Like if our gut is not doing good, our body's not doing good. It's plain and simple. I had a parasite a while back and when I got that parasite, it wrecked my gut, wrecked my gut lining. My health like took a turn. Like it was so hard to recover from that because I didn't have good gut health. Building that back up has been a process and the health slowly gets better. We cannot deny that. So adding a good probiotic in, getting the fiber in, you name it. I put a link down below for a probiotic that I would recommend. I've talked about it before, so it's no surprise. It's called Seed, but that is a special 25% off discount link if you wanna try them out. I don't typically like probiotics. I like this one because they're different and they put their money where their mouth is. As I've stated before, it's got a capsule inside of a capsule. I highly, highly recommend if you're on the fence, you just try it because it's something that you will feel within a couple of days. Focusing on your gut health could be a priority for you, and if it is a priority, it could start changing how you feel. Okay, so starting with a microbiome shift by adding this into your diet, adding the good probiotic, adding the fiber in. So that link down below gets you 25% off. You will likely feel a difference within two or three days. It's that powerful. So again, top line of the description underneath this video for 25% off. The other thing that Hong Kong does is they have a really good cultural balance. What I mean by that is 
they tend to balance out poor parts of their life with good parts of their life. If they eat junk, they tend to eat a lot of other healthy food to balance it out. It's culturally integrated that you don't just go binge on bad food. Like they tend to balance it out. And that is kind of a, a just a cultural thing there. It just happens subconsciously. The other piece that's really interesting that really makes a big, big, big dent is their portions. And even fast food is different there. They don't have super sizes. A medium soda in Hong Kong is five ounces smaller than a medium soda in the United States. That's a lot of calories if you're talking fully leaded soda here. So those portion sizes make a big, big, big difference. And then what's even wild, more wild, Stanford did a study looking at walking and steps, 717,000 people. And they found that Hong Kong had the highest step count. And it's not even a city that you would say like, is known for being walkable. Like I'm sure the air quality isn't all that great. There's a lot of things going against Hong Kong, but people are active, they eat diverse, and they seem to have that balance. It's just wild, right? Like we picture perfect sunny environment, but not necessarily with Hong Kong. Okay, moving into Switzerland. There was a study published in Nutrients that found that the French and Italian areas of Switzerland, those diet influences had better diets, and lived longer, whereas the German influence, not so much. It's kind of interesting because the Italian and the French influence would be much more of like a Mediterranean influence with Switzerland, right? But Switzerland is an extremely active community, active country, right? But also like some of the highest, if not the highest life satisfaction scores in the world. People that live in Switzerland love life, okay? Also high income, high education, good healthcare, there's a lot of socioeconomic and sociodemographic things going towards Switzerland too. And you combine that with the Mediterranean influence of the diet, er, not so much on the German influence because the beer and bratwurst probably doesn't coincide very well with a healthy lifestyle, but eating good amounts of protein while hiking up the Matterhorn, that's probably a pretty good healthy and fun life, right? Okay, now the last one is a series of regions or a series of countries in the region. We're talking about the Nordic regions. So we're talking about like Sweden. And you know, it's interesting because you look at like Sweden and Finland and Denmark, these countries, like we do longitudinal studies looking at their life expectancy. We've looked at stuff with saunas. They have some of the lowest cardiovascular disease risk in the world based on like their sauna usage, their activity. But then we look at the diet and it gets even more interesting. There was a study published in BMC Public Health, took a look at 83,000 people over a long period of time and throughout 8,500 of them eventually dying. What they found is that the lowest risk of mortality was associated with a 200 gram per day intake of Nordic fruits and vegetables. So that's things like tubers and beets and things like that. Okay, but also 20 to 25 grams per day of fatty fish, of fat coming from fish. Okay, plus low fat dairy consumption and lean meat consumption. Hmm, all right. Sounds like a pretty good diet to me, right? What's interesting is that the Nordic regions eat a very, very similar diet to the Mediterranean regions, but with a slightly bit more protein influence and a little bit lower glycemic. The carbohydrates they're consuming are much more barley and oats and things like that, which are low glycemic, high fiber. And they're eating a lot of tubers, they're eating a lot of root vegetables. So beets, parsnips, I guess you could kind of say potatoes in a way, like uh, you know sweet potatoes, things like that. Uh, carrots, onions, leeks. I did a video talking about the Vikings a while back and the Viking diet was very similar. Like wheat doesn't grow too well in the Nordic, but barley can. And the same kind of thing with these like root vegetables. Low glycemic, so they probably have tremendous metabolic profiles. But one of the most interesting things that the Nordic regions consume, independent of like turnips and parsnips and all this, is their wild game consumption. They have one of the highest rates of like wild game consumption of anywhere in the world. It's so wild. Now we can't say 100% that's gonna like help them live longer or not, but we can say that's less antibiotics, we do know, based on other literature, that wild game meat has a better essential fatty acid profile, has a better amino acid profile, and higher protein content. So if that's just a part of their life, and they're not eating farm-raised animals as much, that's a huge thing. And it does add up. Every little bit plays a piece here. So perhaps what we could do is craft the ultimate lifestyle by looking at all of these things, right? Now, Switzerland, you've, you can't always just magically make yourself make more money and, and have high life satisfaction, but we can see there that being comfortable with your life and happy with your life is an important thing. So doing what you can there. 
Hong Kong, we can say, okay, let's make some healthy stir fry. Let's go ahead and decrease our portion sizes. If we go and we eat junk food, let's try to balance it out for a couple days and eat healthy and not demonize that as something that's disordered eating. Let's look at that as, hey, that's balancing it out. And that's an integration into my life to say, I'm gonna eat something junky, okay, but I'm still gonna eat something healthy tomorrow. I'm gonna walk a lot and I'm gonna do it often. Okay? And then I'm gonna say, okay, well, what do the Nordic people eat? Hmm, I'm gonna eat my sardines. I'm gonna eat my mackerel. I'm gonna eat my salmon. I'm gonna eat my turkey turnips and my beets and my sweet potatoes and my parsnips and my onions and my leeks and I'm going to enjoy it and then I'm going to go sit in the sauna and I'm going to listen to Tupac. I'll see you tomorrow.